so much for the invitation and uh, I realized it was five o'clock in the afternoon and I won't tell you what time it is for me, but um, I, uh, tonight I really wanted to give, because I realize this is part of research week, a bit of an overview um, and, I, and, and you may notice that I uh, started with a deliberately provocative title, um, which is re very relevant to what's going on and I'm going to try and just start off with um, uh, a little bit of um, here. Uh, a little bit of a video for you to watch, and then we'll see if we can get it working. Robbie and I had it going before, so. As Donald Trump nears the 100th day of his presidency, he is celebrating the number of executive orders he signed and pushing a new plan to cut taxes on corporations for more on this. It's time for a closer look. <laughs> will mark the 100th day of Trump's presidency, and Trump is desperate for positive accomplishments to celebrate. Yesterday, his White House released a statement bragging that Trump will have signed 30 executive orders during his first 100 days, which is ridiculous. Claiming you've been a good president just because you signed a lot of executive orders makes no sense. But don't just take it from me, take it from this guy. We have a president that can't get anybody to do anything, so he signs, you know, executive orders. We have a president that can't get anything done, so he just keeps signing executive orders. And he doesn't want to sign all these executive orders. It's a basic disaster. You can't do it. He's supposed to get together and pass a law. And he doesn't want to do that because it's too much work. And he doesn't want to work too hard. He wants to go back and play golf. It's <laughs> right. Like a law of physics, for every Trump action, there's an equal and opposite Trump flip. I swear, if Trump said the bathroom was down the hall and to the right, I'm sure we'd find an old clip. Down the hall and to the left. <laughs> so, we live in a time, uh, if I can get this working again, you probably told me the church. We live in a time, and this will be the central uh, thesis of the chat that we're gonna have. We live in a time when people vote for a president who provides alternative facts. We, and at the same time, we also live in a time where we've adopted technology on our daily basis that was basically unthinkable 40 or 50 years ago. And so what, my th what I'd like to put to you is that we as health researchers and clinicians who hope to really change the world with our research, we need to understand how these things happen because we could use this awareness to make uh, our innovations work in the world. So, my objective is to change your behavior. I've said it, okay? And my objective is that by the end of this presentation, you should be able to discuss the steps in a model for implementing knowledge into practice you should be able to name at least three sources of barriers to implementation of evidence into practice, and you should be able to discuss some implementation strategies that are based on implementation research and also behavioral theory, including those derived from the fields of economics and marketing that could be adapted to increase the uptake of evidence. So, 17 years. More than, it's now, it's said that there's more than 17 years uh, from knowledge being generated until it's into the healthcare practice. And of that, only about 14% of that is really believed to enter day-to-day -day clinical practice. And so this is the problem that we are dealing with on a daily basis. This all breakthrough and no follow-through. Uh, from this Washington Post, there's consistent evidence that research findings are not translated into practice, that 30 to 40% do not get effective treatments, and 20 to 25 percent get care that is not needed or potentially harmful. So, my first objective was to discuss the challenges in, in implementing best practice and the steps in the knowledge to action cycle. So the first thing before I get started, does anybody know what the odds of you changing your practice based on listening to me talk are? If I... <laughs> and you can be honest. Low. How low? Zero. <laughs> Good start, Michael. It's one percent. So if I do a didactic talk and you don't participate, then it's probably I have a one percent chance of changing your behavior. 
So let's learn about you a little bit so I get a sense of where you're from. I want to ask you, how many of you are doing preclinical work? Basic science work. Okay, some of you, great. How many of you are in clinical research? Great. How many of you are in implementation research? Okay, so we have some of those. How many of you have had successful implementation? <laughs> great. <laughs> And how many of you are clinicians just looking for a break? <laughs> okay, so what I want to put to you for a moment, and I'll ask that you just, uh, I know that sometimes when a speaker stops, the opportunity is to actually go and speak to your partner beside you. I'm going to ask you to think about something that you've innovated or developed, and, or a best practice you've tried to implement, and I want you to write it down and think about it, and particularly one that you've had challenges in getting going. It could be a protocol for research, it could be um, an innovation you have, and I want you to think about something that you can put on your phone or whatever, and we're going to use this as we go through this exercise. Okay, so now you've got this. I'm going to start with the knowledge to action cycle. This is from uh, Ian Graham and Joe Logan, and they're uh, both Canadian, so I can shamelessly flaunt them. Um, but th this model has been uh, widely used, and we like it because it, ha it was a synthesis of some of the pre previous models of knowledge translation. And knowledge translation people, implementation scientists, and no, no offense to the people in the room, are great at creating models. They're really great. I mean, if I, I, uh, my colleague uh, Heather Kalkun, I think she had like 40 models she reviewed to see them all. But this is just one you can argue that you like another one. But the first thing I wanted to highlight is that you folks who told me you're in the preclinical or you're in the clinical research, you're in this part of the cycle. You're in the knowledge creation cycle. The knowledge inquiry, the knowledge synthesis, and, and really bringing it into use. Forward. Okay, so that's where we're going to start with this process. Does anybody know how many papers you'd have to read on average every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, to keep up in most fields? Right, good ad, good question. So every one of us would have to read 20 papers. It's like drinking water from a fire hose. That's the picture. So, and we know from our research that we've done is that individual studies are rarely sufficient to change policy and practice, that people don't get ac often access research evidence, that it's all of variable quality. We know that n health decision makers are particularly poorly trained in critical appraisal, and most people have less than an hour a week to synthesize or read the literature. In, in some research that Nancy Salbach and we did, we, we, we found that therapists relied foremost on peers for their information. They sought information from the literature um, with the help of uh, their students. Um, and the older therapists in particular described that they didn't have the sufficient skills to do this. And they felt insufficient time to do this. So we've been doing this in a variety of populations. Uh, we've started with the primary ABI research. We started to synthesize it in a variety of evidence-based reviews. We have the acquired brain injury evidence-based review, the stroke rehabilitation evidence-based review. You have the Cochrane reviews if you want. You have spinal cord injury, rehab evidence, which are all through Bob Tiesel and our, some of our groups um, in Canada who've been very interested in trying to make the literature a little bit more synthesized. And we've also had an interest in evidence-based recommendations. And why is that? Well, because clinical practice guidelines are um, believed to be uh, a way of synthesizing that literature and adding in the opinion of the people who are going to use them. So you have clinicians, you have stakeholders, you have uh, all the people who it might affect. And so they're really important because they take it from this systematic review of the literature to what's real. And I always like it because whenever I've developed guidelines for stroke or concussion, we like the people who are clinicians because they're like the get real, that'll never happen, right? They're, they're, they're very, very real about what's going on. And so these are some resources you might want to choose to take a look at. Um, strokebestpractices.ca has, it's our Canadian guidelines and um, they're available to you. So this idea of tailoring the evidence to the user is something that we all need to think about. So. I've introduced you to the cycle in the center part of the cycle, and now I'm going to ask you to think about, uh, I said to you that I wanted you to name three sources of barriers. So, in the cycle, 
you start to adapt the knowledge to the local context and you need to now assess the barriers to knowledge use. So, uptake of evidence is influenced by a large number of factors and again the implementation scientists will tell you there's a whole bunch of frameworks around barriers as well and there's the, the uh, consolidated framework as well. I, I like it for, for simplicity just to think in general terms uh, from this which looks at three things. First of all, the perception of the evidence. Now, uh, for those of you who have clinical, you'll know that when you go into a guide, you bring a guideline to your colleagues, they say, they usually find a reason to find a flaw with it. So the first thing is the perception of the evidence. The second thing is the related to the potential adopters. So who's gonna actually use your evidence? And the third thing is the environment they work in. So what does that mean? That means you need to think about these three things as you think about your innovation. So I asked you to write down an innovation or a change you wanted to do. Now I want you to think about what are the perceptions of the research evidence or the innovation? Do you know what the perceptions of the users will be? Do you know, if have you ever talked to them? Have you ever gone and looked at, at what they do on a data base, basis to see how they might use the evidence? Have you looked at the uh, adopters and what they're doing? And have you looked at the environment they work in? So, I want you to sit down and just spend a minute to write those barriers to your evidence. What are the things you, that come to mind when you think about those three things? The perceptions of the evidence, are they gonna be convinced by your evidence? Second of all, what are the, the potential adopters? Um, and the factors related to the practice environment. Okay, so here's particularly for those in the rehabilitation area um, of research, um, we have a very unique challenge, which is that people re recover at different rates. But even if you think of any health condition, what are the key things that you need to think about as you want to, you have to put in a recommendation? Anybody want to foster guess? What do you need to put in a recommendation to help people who are going to use them? Pardon? A summary? A summary, yeah, that's good, of the evidence. What else, if you're recommending the person? What benefit it will give you? Yeah, what else? The strength of the evidence? The strength of the evidence, yeah. What they need to do. Pardon? What they need to do. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. So here's the challenge for all of us, is that we think, oh, thou shalt do you know, uh, constraint-induced movement therapy to recover the arm, or thou shalt give uh, uh, TPA for stroke for a stroke uh, or thrombolysis, but the first, the actual reality is is you need to know the characteristics of the target population. You need to know what severity of stroke they are. You need to know what what they look like. You need to you need to know what the dose of the intervention is. You need to know what time post injury. If you can give it in the window of three hours of TPA or six out uh, six weeks post stroke, is this, this and then you need to know what the likely outcome. And one of the problems is, and this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow when I talk about stroke rehab evidence, is that oftentimes when you actually get into the evidence, many of the characteristics that clinicians were going to ask you about and the doctors are going to ask you are not in the syntheses. The specifics of any of these things will be missing. So this is a real problem for barriers. And furthermore, when we actually grade guidelines, we've, we've published a number of times ratings of the previously published guidelines. We know that um, this rating called the Appraisal of Guidelines Research and Evaluation Instrument rates a number of, of different elements of the guidelines, whether they're clear on their scope and purpose, whether they involve the right stakeholders, whether they use a rigorous model, whether they're clear and they're applicable, and whether they're editorially independent. So when we have guidelines, even these nice syntheses that have people to go to, we consistently found, and I've done this exercise for three or four populations, we did it for pediatric urology, in this case, I'm showing you the cognitive rehab guidelines that we reviewed. Uh, if you do the stroke rehab guidelines, we have another publication about that. You find that almost all the guidelines find, fell down on applicability. So they have not tailored the evidence to the users. And frequently you see them falling down on clarity of presentation. And when we looked at this, we find that guidelines provided, the, the, the applicability items, the guidelines provide advice and tools on how the recommendations can be put in practice. 
The guidelines provide barriers and facilitators to implementation, the potential resource applications that require. The guidelines typically fall down on this area. So, just to walk you through a little bit more of the thinking around the barriers to implementation. So let's think about a physiotherapist, or let's think about a physician. What's their knowledge of the evidence that you have? Do they know about what you're doing? Are you working in your lab and you've never told them? What's their typical skills and habits? What's their social professional role? Is it important for them to be an expert? What are their beliefs? Do they believe they can do this? If, if you put body weight support training for people, if they don't have enough help, do they believe they can do it? What are their motivations? And what are their other emotional responses? And we're going to get back into this in a moment. Okay, so let's think about now, you're introducing your innovation, you've got the adopters on board, but now you've got an environment. Now, I've been showing some of you folks about the Australian healthcare system, so I, I know a little bit about it, but I imagine that it's similar to ours, that most clinicians are very, very busy, most, uh, most things, um, there's a lot of funny policies and rules, like you know, what the government will pay for and what the government won't pay for. They have a time limit on how they're done. And these are all the things that get in the way of your innovation actually getting into practice. And there's many, many more barriers which I'm not going to go through. But I just think it's really critical for us to think about. And if you think about what I asked you before, I want you to think about, did you capture, when I asked you to um, think about the barriers to your innovation, did you think about some of these things that might have come up? Okay, so I've told you that there's problems with the evidence and the way it's packaged. I've told you that there's a messy world out there that people are doing. And should we really just give up? Should we stop trying to implement? This is a question that we've asked. So, I want, so my third objective was to, to name some evidence-based strategies for implementation practices from, that you can do, use in your own work. Okay. So I want to tell you a bit of a story. So on the 30th, some of you may have heard this story if you've been to the KT uh, conferences, but I'll, I'll tell it anyways. So on the 30th of September, 1846, one of the first reported uses of ether anesthesia was done uh, by a dentist by the name of William Thomas Green Morton, and he removes a very ulcerated tooth. This, he was so excited about it. this dentist actually on a, a few weeks later, a couple weeks later, actually appeared in the operating theater of, a mass, of the Mass General and administered the ether before a surgeon was going to do tumor re removal. On the 18th of November, the account of this ether is published and the spread uh, around the world in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. And by the 15th of December, ether anesthesia is first in, administered in Paris. And by the 19th of December, another person has used it. So I told you when I started that the average time to implementation is 17 years. So anybody guess how many months this took? Three months. So we have an innovation that went around the world in three months. So my question to you is, some innovations have lots of pull. Now this is what happened the last time we released our guidelines for Canadian stroke. Well, not really. <laughs> so why is it that some innovations have pull? Why is it, and this is what I want you to think about, is that we know that some innovations are very hard to get into practice, but some innovations like ether anesthesia and the smartphone you have in your hand are innovations that you've grabbed at, you might have lined up for, and you were excited about. So. My question to you are to sit down and use an example of your smartphone if you choose to, or if you want to use the ether example, and write a few reasons you think why these innovations have pull. Why were they easily <coughs> translated into practice as opposed to some of the things we know were challenging? And I'll give you a minute to do that, and then we're going to come back and I'll hear from you.
Okay, so let's talk about it a little bit. So why did anesthesia work and move so quickly? It was a yawning light. I would... Pardon? It was a yawning light. Yeah. There was no other way of doing it. Yeah. So yeah. the previous thing was bad for doctors and bad for patients, right? It completely fitted a need that was yeah. everyone was appreciative of. Right. So it was really good for everybody involved, right? What else about it? It's easy. It's easy, technically easy. You just uh, put the ether on a, a cloth and you put it on their face and they go to sleep. What else? Pardon? Not, Not too costly, right? Immediate results. Immediate results. Immediate evidence that it works, right? Okay, so let's talk about your smartphone. So, how did you come to a doctor's? How many of you have a smartphone? I assume, I'm assuming that some people don't, right? Okay, so most of you do. Okay, so what, did, what happened? How did you take up the smartphone? You know, the smartphone has probably, I think it's, the estimates are like 10 times as much computing power as existed in the whole world in 1945. What's in your hand? So, so why do you adopt it? How did you adopt it? What did they? Why was it, why did you adopt it? Made life easier. Pardon? Made life easier. Exactly, it made life easier. What else did you like about it? My friend had one. Your friend had <laughs> one. So let's stick there. Let's just say, so, so why was your friend having one important? Um, it was cool, I could try it out and see yeah. what you could do on it. Thank you, that's a very good point. And Steve Jobs mm. caught on to that. What else? Anybody else think of anything? Why you took your smartphone? You adopted it pretty quickly. Pardon? It's small and compact. Exactly. It's convenient. It's marketing. It's marketing. What else? Instant gratification. Instant gratification. Right. We like the ether. What else? Peer pressure. Pardon? Peer pressure. Perhaps. Yeah. It's well designed. Well, well, let's just stop for a second about peer pressure. What do you think? And it comes back to the other thing, my friends. What, what, what's that? What's that peer pressure? Oh, for me, it was my daughter's harassing me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and wanting to take, send me photos and I couldn't get them and things yeah. like that. And being able to contact me in ways that yeah. they preferred. Right. That sort of stuff. So there was a social yeah. element to it that's critical, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so, so that's really good understanding. So when you think about your innovation now, of what you innovated, all you basic scientists and clinical researchers, did you create something that was really cool? Did you create something that your daughter and, and son would actually find fascinating? Did you actually create something that would have an emotional attachment to it, right? People love iPhones, and this is what Steve Jobs tapped into, right? He tapped into the fact, and, and, and these are the things I think we all need to think about as we think about implementation and how to make our evidence better. Henry Ford said it well, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have told me I, they, I, they wanted faster horses. So we, as researchers, have to think about our users before our users know what they're going to use it for. And Steve Jobs tapped into this. It, it's very similar. It's really hard to design products by focus group. A lot of times people don't know what they're going to do until they see it or use it and you show it to them. So, Keep that in mind as you think about why some of the innovations we have are not going out anywhere. Okay, so I've told you about how we might improve the quality of the evidence and the quality of the innovation that you might, uh, you might be putting in place and, and, and the quality of this synthesizing of it. So let's think about now, how am I going to get this into practice? Okay, so my point here by all these is that I wanted to leave you with is that there's lots of other people in the world who thought about change and that for many of us it's actually sometimes good and I've read some of these books it's actually sometimes good to get out of the science room with all due respect to people like Jeremy Grimshaw and others um, and say other people have thought about change and some of these insights that come out from some of the books like Malcolm Gladwell's <coughs> Tipping Point and uh, John Cotter's Leading Change and 
Richard Brimmel's strategy, good strategy, bad strategy. And Terry O'Reilly, who's a Canadian who does marketing lessons, uh, and he has a podcast, which is one of the most popular podcasts in Canada, on um, iTunes um, about marketing and advertising. And I, I listen to it religiously every week because as a person interested in implementation, I'm interested how in 30 seconds somebody can convince me to buy a product, right? That's what they do. They, they, in 30 seconds they've convinced me. And so how do they do that? And we're going to talk a little bit about this. And this is what I think is the flaw and the challenge for all of us as we think about implementation of what we're going to do, is that knowledge translation depends on behavior. There's somebody's behavior you're going to have to change. It could be a citizen, it could be a policymaker, it could be the CEO of your hospital, it could be a manager you're dealing with, and to improve care, we have to change behavior. And so to change behavior, we truly need to understand what the determinants of behavior are. Okay? Which comes back to the odds that I told you about before. So, I've asked you to think about your, your innovation that you had. I've asked you to face down those, be, um, those barriers that you're going to face as you put it into practice. And now, I want you to think about what are the series of behaviors that you're trying to change in a person. So let's say, maybe I'll take an example. Anybody have an example they want to share? of the innovation they're working on? You know, um, I'm working in Nepal and we're trying to change the behavior of mothers-in-law and fathers-in-law to their daughters-in-law to improve the care of pregnant women. Right. And when a woman gets married in Nepal, she goes and lives with her husband's family. And she's essentially the sexual slave to make babies. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to change everybody's attitude to doing that. And uh, we did it, we've done it with song, because song is very popular in the Nepal. So we set up a competition in the villages of the hill country to come up with songs that uh, raise the status of the pregnant woman and encourage behavior change that way. That's amazing. And we did it that way because many of the people are illiterate, and yet song is sung by everybody. And we were able to change the attitudes of the older men and the older women in the community. So that's an example. Great. Thank you. That's excellent. Okay. Um, anybody else wanted to share an example of a behavior they wanted to change? <coughs> My uh, is speech pathologist uptake of the uh, Australian aphasia rehabilitation pathway and best practices is the innovation. We want the clinicians to take up those recommendations. So, what is the behaviour that you're really looking to do? Which is the key one? Audit and feedback. We want them to audit their practices and uh, find out whether they are doing those okay. recommendations. So there's a few of them. So is it all the is it all the speech pathologists? Or all aphasia therapists? Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So those are the potential adopters. Yeah. Okay. And when do they usually perform that? Do they do it every day? Do they have to do it once yeah, a week? Yeah, every time they see someone okay. with aphasia, they should be doing okay. a certain series of things. Okay, great. In your example, how did you, how often was the behavior needed? Once a week, once every day? The oh. songs. Yeah, the songs, yeah. Well, because the songs get learned by the community and they get sung all the time, Yeah. we don't have to reinforce. Right. To me, is changing the behavior of a social network. Right. And the key thing is to change everybody at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the song is one of the things that can do that because when everybody gathers together and sings the song, they're all different right. after the song. That's great. Okay, so that's a great example. And so I <coughs> got interested in some of the work of Michi and uh, They've put together the, what they call the behavioral change model, or the COMB, and 
what it really thinks about it's kind of like if you've been watching a crime, right? You had the motive, you had the means, and you had the opportunity, right? So, so um, you know that the criminal was capable of doing it. You know that they had the motive because they wanted to get the money, and they they had a quiet back road, where a back alley where they could take the person. So it's very similar to the model. And just to to think about it as these three things that we have to think about is first of all capability. So let's think about the speech pathologist. Do they have the capability, the psychological, i.e., they have the knowledge and the physical capability, like the space or the or the uh, skills that are needed to do the skill. I'm going to talk a bit about motivation. What are the pr brain processes that we talk about motivation are those processes that energize and direct behavior. And then there's two types of motivation. I will get back to this in a moment. There's more of a reflective thing where you're self-reflective and thoughtful. And there's an automatic, which is more emotional and reflects. And you probably tapped into a lot of this, right? That sort of emotional element of singing together and the opportunity. So this is a very interesting thing. One of the things is this opportunity. Many times you have to have this physical space, but there's also the social opportunities. So I will give the example of, say a physician is learning a new skill. So a young guy comes in and brings in this new special kind of surgery. And the senior physician has never been trained in it. But yet the senior physician is recognized as the leader by acknowledging that they don't actually have the skill to do this, they may be afraid, they may not have the social opportunity or the social, what's going on around them to change and, rec and do this. So they may have some motivational issues and they may also have this social feeling that they're in the hierarchy that, that doesn't allow them to have the opportunity to say, I really don't know. So bringing in a bit more pop psychology from a Nobel Prize winning thinker um, is from Daniel Kahneman and he, thought about two processes, and there's a lot more to this, but it speaks of motivation. And he thinks of the system one, which is the brain processes that the operates in fairly intuitively, suddenly, and without our conscious control. We know that on a day-to-day -day basis, we take shortcuts, right? For example, you're deciding about breakfast, you put a piece of toast in the, in the toaster and you go, because you just don't want to waste your, emotion, your energy. Um, we, we make shortcuts in our thinking um, and uh, and I, I don't want to get too much into this, but this is there, and, and that's because there are inherent survival advantages in being able to make these quick decisions for things that are really uh, more automatic or reflective. And probably from a cognitive neuroscience point of view, these are probably more limbic system mediated. From the system two, which is more reflective and probably more prefrontal cortex, um, it's it's responsible for our individual decision making. It's, for most of us in the room, this is the system we think we always use, okay? <laughs> we're scientists, we're researchers, we mostly think we're, we are living in this world, okay? So, this goes back to Michi's thinking about motivation, the reflective, and the uh, automatic. So, <laughs> question, which system does this guy appeal to? System one, automatic, reflective, emotional, fear, right? You guys, things are getting worse, bad, okay. What system does this young, this young lady appeal to? <laughs> Unfortunately for her, she's a system two. What about this guy? Both, <laughs> right. And work of Sunstein, if you ever read Cass Sunstein, he's a behavioral economist, and, and also Daniel Kahneman has shown that in most elections, the leaders who usually won, win our system one have to have at least some system one appeal. So you as researchers have to learn to have some system one appeal if you want to get your research done, okay? And I'm just telling you because um, this is really eloquent. If you're look, interested in this, this is in the Scientific American Mind uh, last month. They go through a very eloquent explanation of how Trump won the election and what the things he did at his rallies that were consistent with some of the psychology of this. And so, and John Cotter's statement I think is very helpful for us to think about. I like this one. People change what they do less because they are given an analysis that shifts their thinking because they are told a truth 
that influences their feelings. So, you've influenced the feelings of everybody, you know, and that's changed their behavior. You've influenced their feelings about the, the mothers, you've influenced the feelings of the community, and that's when real change occurs. So unfortunately, while we all came to hear me talk about what the answer to this issue of implementation science, and I threw it back in your face and said, there's a lot to think about, I hope that I've left you with the idea that this is important. So, okay, so now I want to talk about how we might use this information that I've given you um, over the next few minutes to see what's in your toolkit. Okay, so let's use the infra in this behavioral framework to start to work. I know it's small, but I'm going to talk, walk you through it quickly, and this is all available in Michi's nice paper on this. So, the problem I would argue, and when you go and look in the, the data, is most people default to educational interventions. And I was so excited to hear your intervention was not at all educational, okay? Because educational is very good, training and education is really good if a person doesn't have the physical or psychological capability to do what they are supposed to do. It works really quite well. And if you enable them by giving them uh, train, you give them the, the right equipment and you give them the right support and coaching, that will help. But how many of you think the biggest problem with innovation and putting your in implementation in is due to this problem? Do you think the speech pathologists don't know what they should be doing? <coughs> do you think they have the psychological capability of doing it? Probably, right? So that comes to this issue of the physical opportunity and the social opportunity. So this is where, if we think the problem with the, is in the, is the person does not have the physical opportunity, we can start to in restructure their environment. We can restrict them from doing the bad thing we don't want to do them. This is what ICU people do. They put it so that you cannot stick the wrong tube into the wrong one. That's sort of environmental restructuring because I want to restrict you from having the opportunity to, to make an error. And I can also enable you. And similarly, this social opportunity is really, really critical. And in the example you provided, you've started to give enablement and some uh, uh, assistance with making the environment more socially acceptable to the, to the idea that you have. And then, of course, you have this motivation. And unfortunately, for many cases, we need to look at people's motivation. Many times it will be financial, it will be to do with their social situation. Um, and when we start to think that the problem is persuasion, we're no longer into the educational mode. We're into things like persuasion, incentives. We're still coercion. Um, and then we start to have to model it and restructure it for them. I hope I've given you a little bit of a sense of this because this is the central problem with most of the implementation science research is that there's very little theory-informed implementation research. So when people went at it, they didn't start to think about who's going to use it and they didn't start to do this. So who's been thinking about this? Most of you, uh, the implementation scientists in the room, I know you will have heard this, um, will be familiar with this group called the Cochrane Effective uh, Practice and Organization of Care. This is a group that analyzes the publications about knowledge translation and strategies, and they've identified a number of major headings, deliver, how you deliver healthcare, financial arrangements, governance, and I'm only gonna talk to you about implementation strategies because I don't have long enough. If you wanna go to the Go Cochrane, but if you really, really wanna know what's been tested in different settings and which things might work, the Cochrane group is an excellent website. So we know from the research, and this is earlier research, that just simply distributing educational materials and didactic education meetings don't really work. Sometimes coming to a conference, uh, having an opinion leader coming in and teaching you about how to do stroke care or how to do the injections for spasticity <laughs> or whatever, um, patient-mediated interventions, giving people feedback, and educational strategies may be helpful. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're going to do, and tomorrow I'm going to talk a bit about what we've been doing in stroke, um, in some of these areas, but there's participatory research, there's small groups, there's computerized decision support, uh, improving the multidisciplinary collaboration, 
starting to do a mass media campaign, uh, financial interventions sometimes work. So one of the things that we almost always default to is audit and feedback, because it's easy, right? And usually the effect size is moderated by if they're not performing well to start off with, that usually helps, okay? So um, if the person responsible for their audit is a supervisor or a colleague, if it's provided more than once, and if it's given both in verbal and writing, and if it includes clear targets and an action plan. Okay, Educ educational meetings, courses and workshops are pretty self-explanatory. Um, interactive small groups, we've tried to make it a little interactive today, and then reminders are pretty obvious. They, they're prompting the healthcare provider. Similarly, uh, you know, computerized um, are, are believed to be very helpful, and again, when you look at the literature, there's still um, evidence that it works, but it has um, limited effect. And opinion leaders also, uh, where you get somebody who's a credible person, I don't know why you invited me, um, but, and I don't consider myself an opinion leader, but um, you know, somebody who's really knowledgeable about the clinical care is really important. Some of the work that uh, Dean Fixon has done at the National Implementation Research Network is very interesting because what he thinks about is he looked across sectors and he looked at forestry and a number of education and health. And what he found was that usually um, uh, the implementation team uh, concept is very important. So how many of you have done an implementation of a new uh, health, health um, electronic health record? How many of you have had an implementation of, of a new computer system? What do they usually do? Not working. They're not working. <laughs> yeah, the ones that are successful, they usually bring out the red coats, the guys in the red coat who are, who are supposed to be there to help problem solve. In an Apple store, what do you got? You got all those guys dressed in, dressed in the blue shirts. That's because they're there to make you touch and feel and learn. And he thought about this concept of procedural fidelity. So for example, if I wanted to implement the AVERT protocol, I need to be faithful to the procedure of the AVERT protocol. That's the first problem. But we also need people who know how to do implementation. They know how to go into the environment. They need to say, the problem here is the leadership structure. The problem here is the incentive structure. The problem here is whatever. And so they need to understand the implementation and they need to be faithful to the plan implementation. So you need two kinds of expertise. You need somebody who knows the protocol, who's an expert on that, but you also need somebody who knows how to do KT. I'm going to talk a bit about action research, and that's where it's what we call integrated KT, where you're learning at the same time. And one of the examples we have at Toronto Rehab is we have an integrated team of researchers and therapists right on the unit, on our stroke service. It's around the corner from our inpatient unit, and every single patient we were, what we found was that in the past, everybody would uh, come into our program, we had these really fancy gate labs, and they went to the back of them, and nobody knew how to use them, nobody knew how to do the data. So what we said is, let's teach all our therapists how to interpret all these fancy data, and let's get them into the clinic and get them touching it. And we integrated some new protocols, like we started to do perturbation training um, to try and get them to use a new technique. And basically what we did is we, um, we integrated the, the, the researchers and the clinicians together. We have a number of clinics like this at Toronto Rehab which have been very successful. So the most daunting thing about this when I look at this, and I only gave you a smattering of the results from Cochrane, is that when you look at all these things we think are good, unfortunately their effect sizes are relatively small. 5% change in practice, 10% change in practice. So it's really remarkable when you have a s truly successful change in practice. And that's why my central thing is we need to understand how to change people's motivation behavior. And one of my colleagues is doing an arts informed, uh, uh, similar to you, she's doing an arts informed knowledge translation strategy where she shows everybody a play about Alzheimer's and sees how they react after they. So we need to be much more creative than all of these things. With all due respect to all the great work that the implementation scientists have done. So, the other thing that I find is interesting, and um, I'm almost done, uh, was that we often do not ask clinicians what they're going to stop doing. We tell them, there's this great practice, let's do this audit feedback. So Linda, 
Did you give them something they could stop doing when you went in? I suggested they stop doing swallowing assessments. <laughs> that flew well, right? Yeah. Sarcasm, hopefully noted. Yeah. So, so one of the problems is is that none of us think about de-implementation of useless strategies. And part of what we need to do is also think about this. And this is a, a cluster RCT um, with a modest result uh, where they tried to uh, improve blood management perioperatively, and they tried to stop people from giving inappropriate transfusions. They had um, they had education feedback on how to use it, and they gave them the benchmarks. And the interesting thing is maybe because they were part of a study, both groups reduced their inappropriate use, and it seemed like the group who were in the intervention group started to use some other strategies. Okay, so we've had an interest. How many of you have heard of lean? Okay, so we've had a lot, a little bit of experience of this, and I don't have time to speak, talk much about that. But lean is a manufacturing method that looks at trying to get out the value. It focuses on patients, not the hospital, not the staff. It focuses on a value stream for the patients, and everything else is considered waste. So. If the patient is flowing from the emergency room down to here, all of these bottlenecks are waiting lists, they're considered waste. What we're looking for is a straight river. And what, the way we decide if we're going to get rid of a practice is we put a test of value to it. Does it change the patient or the patient information? Would the patient be willing to pay for it? And that's kind of funny if you have a publicly funded system, but what, it, what patients pay for it is would they be willing to pay for it with their time? How many patients would be willing to pay for sitting in your, in your doctor's office for an hour and a half waiting for, opinion, for their opinion? Not many. They're not going to pay for that. Okay? And is it done right the first time? So that's what lean looks at. When you actually apply that to a lot of healthcare, we start to weed out practices, Linda, um, that are unnecessary. Okay, so I'm, I want to chat a bit about this. How many of you have seen this book, Nudge? Okay, so I love this book. Um, it's, it's, it, and, I like, and I follow these guys on Twitter. Um, it basically tells us that you know, when we are operating in system one and system two, um, we have a complex world. Our brain uses strategies to manage, um, to manage the complex things, and we want to save our thinking for the best point part of the day. So this is an example of a nudge. <laughs> Anybody seen this before? <laughs> OK, so you're walking down the street, and um, uh, the nudge nudges you into uh, the, the healthier thing to do, okay? Here's another nudge. They found that if they took this sticker of a fake fly and they stuck it right there on the urinal, that men, being who men are, <laughs> aimed their stream at there and they had 80% less spillage. <laughs> okay, we should use these nudge, okay? Um, now this is another thing which I think is, is a very interesting. They did an RCT. These guys. And there actually is a behavioral insights team in Australia. I know Peter Bragg has just joined them. Um, and uh, and, uh, and I, I haven't learned what they're up to. But I want you to read these and tell me which of these things, um, which this is, they, they, they gave them, a, this was a strategy for registration as donors. Which of these do you think you'd likely respond to the highest? It says, it says on them, thank you, please join the organ donor. donor uh, Every day, thousands of people who see this page decide to register. That's sort of the social norming. Loss framing. Three people die every day because there are not enough organ donors. And the fourth one, reciprocity. If you needed an organ transplant, would you have one? If so, please um, help others. Which one do you think is the most ex effective? Four. Four, right. So do we ever do this in healthcare? Do we ever think about how we could frame what we're innovating? In this way. And so, um, I, will, I really don't have time to talk about how we evaluate any outcomes in great detail, but I think it's important to recognize that knowledge translation is measured by the impact on practice, and a lot of, a lot of the, the, in the, the uh, research we have talks about changing clinician behavior. Very little talks about the impact on patients, and very little um, talks about the impact on healthcare decision makers, and you could measure also the impact on healthcare. I know Shanti is very interested in that. Okay. I'm almost done. But I need to know. Okay, I want you to think about the presentation and I want you to write or think about one or two actions you are going to do differently in the next week or two because of this presentation.
okay, my objective was to change your behavior. So how many of you committed to think about using the, the knowledge to action cycle maybe in their research or in their thinking? Okay. How many can consider they might do a knowledge, their knowledge of barriers and what they, how many will use that stuff in their practice, maybe thinking about barriers? Okay, some of you. And how many thought, maybe I'll use some of those implementation strategies in the next few weeks? Come on, commit to it. I need a commitment. Okay, thank you. I've changed your behavior. No. So, thanks a lot for listening. I, I think the most important thing to ma ma tell you, I guess, is that the reason we do implementation science and we're very interested in it, is that our patients deserve the very best possible care. And so really, we need to overcome those things. And I hope in my talk, I appeal to both system one and system two. Thanks very much. Thanks, more. I know we're short of time. So no, 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 no. I'm happy to answer questions. Fantastic. Very, very enthusiastic uh, message, motivation, behavior. <laughs> it boils down to behavior. I'm sure you're burning to ask questions. Um, who is first? Yeah, Peter. Given how complex it is and how many things are out, moving parts are out of the whole story, and the fact that change is happening all over the throughout the institution and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, what is the, the, is there a real need to structure change so that in an organisation it's done in a sort of step, like a standard process? Yeah. Because that's what, I went to a, a day from Kaiser and they have a team yeah. that have gradually changed the culture by teaching a standard way of implementing yeah. change yeah. and thinking about it yeah. to everybody. Yeah. And then as managers move up the cycle, they've been through the process yes. and they're less resistant to the smart ways of doing things. Right. So, so, so yeah, yeah. it's really a call for, is this really something we have to systematize mm -hmm. in, an organi in, a, in an organization uh, to yeah. actually make it work? Absolutely. I think there needs to be a system, but I, I think you should beware of, okay, uh, I, you know, the Americans think of Canada as the attic of, Can of, of the America. <laughs> um, but uh, not to crit they you have to be aware of people who say that they know everything because it doesn't always work. However, the consultants and the implementation teams are very important in addressing um, some of the key issues. And in our research, which I'll talk about tomorrow, we really need to target organizational leaders probably early in the process. And there are a number of tools like the uh, ORCA tool, which is Organizational Readiness for Change Assessment, which sort of looks at whether the you should go into an organization because it looks at whether it's ready to adopt the practice, whether they have a culture, whether it can be whether there's facilitation. So really doing that readiness for change is a critical thing that I'm sure that Kaiser was doing. They're going around talking to your leaders. And why do they have the credibility? Well, they have the credibility to go talk to your CEO and that's probably where it starts. So for a big organizational change, I think you have to have the leaders. If you're looking at an individual clinician behavior, I think you can be a little bit more um, uh, directed if it's a clinician. However, I do still believe that facilitation from the managers, because they've learned, as you said, is a critical element of that process. So at least the managers knowing why you're there and what you're doing is a, probably a critical thing. Um, discussing uh, in a uh, disease such as MS that I work in, where we now have up to 11, 12 new therapies that patients can be mm -hmm. treated with. Mm -hmm. Now obviously some of the clinical symptoms will dictate what a physician will explain to their patients mm -hmm. as being appropriate or not. Regardless of that, they're still bombarded with pamphlets, with leaflets from different drug companies of choice. Yeah. Now, for half the population, education is good. They want to get as much information about mm -hmm. everything as possible. But there are a subset of people that don't want that level of education. Right. You're the doctor, you tell me. Right. So if we're targeting education programs about treatment or about nutrition interventions, we have to be careful that one size will not fit all mm -hmm. in the marketplace. Yeah. So how do we tweak our systems to have, if they fit this type, then we go down this road, yeah. if they fight fit the other more dictator type situation we go down this road. It's really difficult because both implementations are quite right. costly and, and difficult to, to so, place. So the question then is the behavior of interest is that prior to doing any intervention with the patients, mm -hmm. 
that there's a, an assessment of their educational needs and their educational approach. And that's consistent. I'm not an educational researcher, um, but the you know adult education principles are that we as learners, thank you for coming today, came because it was personally relevant, it might be something that's of interest to you. And so really, if I didn't, I assumed that you were all interested in what I was talking about, if, and that's why you came. And so I think in adults, we need to assess their learning needs. And there are a number of protocols for that um, to assess. We have a protocol that our staff have been trained in called Choices and Changes, which is basically putting the, um, the, on, the onus on the clinician to actually ask the patient, you know, what are your needs? Um, do you have a sense of what, you know, what you'd like to know more about? Many patients tell us, because uh, one of my colleagues, Jill Cameron, we did a thing called timing it right, which is giving caregivers the information at the right time. Um, we try to time it based on their, nerve, their, their readiness for it, and I still think there's a, there's a need to really individualize it. And so the major behavior you need to put in place is that all clinicians know they need to assess the patient's needs. And that's the process you should probably be focusing on in my not so humble opinion. Rather than worrying about all the, the pamphlets and all that stuff, worry about how well did the clinician assess the person's status and then address it with what they're, and then come back to the patient and ask them from patient reported outcomes, did you feel you got the information you needed at the time you got it? give an indicator or an outcome measure, I, we always ask ourselves, if you got the result to this, would it change your practice? So sometimes outcome measures like, I was just talking about this mortality after stroke, let's say. My mortality at my hospital is higher than yours. It will usually trigger a thought about it, but it also frequently triggers explaining. We have a sicker patient, we have this, we have that. So you want to get away to indicators that are more, that have an impact on individuals. And I think the, 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 that it's really about being able to compare against the benchmark. It seems to be very important. People are naturally competitive. Researchers are naturally competitive. Seeing themselves in the red or the green or whatever makes a difference to them. So really influencing their feelings about the, how they're doing against everybody else. And, and, so, and then also looking at, is it something that I can change? And if it's not something I can change, then I don't think that using that indicator is really necessary or, or going to help you in moving forward. Uh, Mark, I, I really enjoyed your, your talk. Um, one, one thing, uh, one anecdote that I had experience of is I heard a lecture by an opera director called Peter Sellers. And this helped me in my geriatric medicine work and things. So my question to you is to help understand how messy and difficult human existence is, how important are the arts to those of us in medicine and research? I think, I think we need to be creative because I think they do appeal to some of the, the uh, you've already heard of examples of where they were really important. You know, we have examples of pet therapy that helped to, you know, elevate the mood of patients in the hospital. We, so I think we as researchers and as, as people who are interested in this, I think need to think about what you can learn from the arts and what you can learn from the sectors that are outside of 
healthcare. I think we tend to go at it with a very narrow focus, and I think you've heard some great examples of where uh, you know you could you, you really need to go out of the box to find something that really will motivate people. So I certainly think that that's um, an area we should be doing more in. Uh, we should really move on, but I, I, I'll take the privilege of being the MC here and ask the last question, <laughs> and that is um, uh, the question about culture, yeah. culture in our organizations and how culture drives behavior and change in behavior. Right. You know, culture eats structure for breakfast, exactly, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, um, can you show? briefly comment on, on that because I think we need to have uh, a leadership from above mm -hmm. showing sort of and an demonstrating a leadership and cultural change if you wish but you need to have that sort of from underneath as mm -hmm. well at the, at the clinical department level nurses doctors right. so you meet somewhere because the good organizations they have and that's really the lean concept, mm -hmm. it's one model coming out mm -hmm. of the Toyota mm -hmm. uh, culture, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, how, how have you tackled that? Uh, um, well, okay, are? so first of all, I'll just say that I've reviewed this from the Cochrane, and there's still not like a clear answer to that question. They, the research that's there is... Um, but if you read some of these, you know, people that I... the books that I've talked about, they yeah. do talk about this. I think that a culture is a combination of a number of factors. It's the, you know, the leadership is one factor, but you can't blame all the leadership. It's what you, it's the, it's a culture uh, also has the people you've hired. So if you don't hire good people or you don't have, you don't tell them why they're coming in, they don't understand their role. Uh, I, what metrics you measure change culture. So if you, if you really, really, really think your patients aren't getting patient-centered care, if you're not, me so I think it's what you measure yeah. and what you and your leadership structure, and then I think it's the uh, the other things like um, the the front the frontline staff's feeling of engagement. Yes, so we do yeah. engagement surveys to yeah. find out how mu how far people will go for UHN Toronto rehab. Yeah. Like how much are they thinking about leaving? And and I think that these are all measures of the positivity of the culture, mm -hmm. but. Um, I don't think that there's any pat answers for that, but if I were starting, I would start with understanding at the frontline level what people are, are experiencing and asking them, do you feel you know what the vision of the hospital is? Do you feel like you know where we're going? Do you feel like you know what the priorities are today? Do you feel like, and then moving to the top of the level and ask the, the uh, ask the, um, the CEO, do you know what the priorities are? And then if there's a really big mismatch, <laughs> If I was a consultant in that hospital, I'd be, like the Kaiser, I'd be saying, guess what, your staff don't know what your vision is, they don't align with the values that you've set out, you know, and so I think that that's, I think those things that we think are a little bit of, as, you know, when the doc, when they start to talk, most people go to sleep, let's talk about our values, let's talk about our mission statement, most people go to sleep, but it's really in how those values are lived out on an every day. It's all very well to say, courage, but then, if somebody comes along and speaks up about an incident where a doctor did something they weren't supposed to do, yeah. they're a whistleblower, and the organization immediately sweeps it under the couch, then so much for your courage. And staff know that, right? If you're if you're not if you're not if you haven't lived the values, your your staff will know that. So I think that it's it is a bit. It, that's my leadership answer to the question, not my implementation science. But I, I think that all of your staff have to feel that they're part and of aligned somewhat with what you're trying to do. And the good thing is, is that we work in healthcare and we have a very noble responsibility. It's not like sausage makers, right? We're not, you know, we're doing a job that, you know, where we can come to and actually change people's lives. So motivation shouldn't be the issue, but unfortunately sometimes it is, right? Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.